Oh, good day. This is Ron McFarland with a cybersecurity update for December 2nd, 2022, getting close to the end of the year. Uh, While these cybersecurity updates are for professionals, students, researchers, and everyone interested in IT, IS, and cybersecurity, uh, there's my contact information on the screen, and I'll also place that in uh, the YouTube area. Again, I'm not a... uh, a professional YouTuber. I am only sharing this information with you um, for your own consumption. And I, what I also like to do is try to go a little bit deeper rather than listing 20 or 30 cybersecurity events, which occur quite often. I just want to touch bases with two, three, and sometimes four items that may be of interest and uh, dig into it just a little bit more. Um, first update is Trigana, that's how I pronounce it, ransomware spotted in increasing attacks worldwide. Well, the way Trigana was working, it was previously an unnamed ransomware. And uh, like with everything, if you're producing a good soda pop, you got to have a name, right? (laughs) Kind of tongue in cheek. So Trigana also launches a Tor. And in other videos, I've talked about Tor, the Tor browser, and how we can use it for our benefit. I also teach uh, a bit about Tor in my certif- certi- uh, certified ethical hacking. By the way, I don't plan on editing out any of my goofs. You get what you get. And I hope it's useful information, even though I do have an occasional goof. Um, so, um, and Monero, that's a, 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 a coinage, if you will, like uh, e-coin, and it's a little bit hard to track Monero, right? It's where, as with Bitcoin, uh, that you can examine the blockchain and really uh, anonymous payments, not so much in Bitcoin, whereas Monero does have that. So ransomware payments in Monero and Trioga, Trigana is becoming more and more active. So here's some other information. Look at that cute little bee on the side. Trigona is the name of a family of large stingless bees, though I think this one really does have kind of a stinger. The ransomware operation has op- adopted this logo on the right, and Trigona supports various, various command line arguments. So it's if you're into computer science and programming like me, or in, if you do take my um, a certified ethical hacking course. We do talk talk about some scripting languages as well as using the CLI for uh, whether it's terminal on the Mac OS or uh, the win- window in uh, uh, the Microsoft. Anyway, again, not going to edit this stuff out. So when encrypting files, though, Trigana encrypts all files on the device except those in specified folders, such as window and program file folders. Obviously, that, that's to help keep the system running, um, whereas some will just totally lock up the system. So Trigana Ransomware renames the encrypted files with the underscore locked extension. And here's an example right here. By the way, I got this image from Bleeping Computer. I put all the resources at the end, so if you want to get these from me uh, or for the PowerPoint, whatever, drop me a note. As an example, the file one.doc would be encrypted and renamed as one.doc underscore locked as shown below, right there. And if you are, so when we talk about these hexadecimal uh, browsers in my certified ethical hacking course, or if you are curious about some of these editors, drop me a note. But when you examine them uh, in the file itself, uh, you can see a uh, the embedded encryption decryption key within the file. You know, you'll see that. Uh, it's kind of masked, so it's hard to get to. It will embed the campaign ID, of course, to unlock and provide you the ransom uh, decryption key. They'll need the campaign ID. It'll embed the victim ID or the company name within the encrypted file. So in a way, if you're using hex edit or many other of these hexadecimal editors, you can find this information out in hex form. It's a little hard to decipher, of course. However, you can spot these certain attributes, if you will. And that's kind of how uh, Trigana has been spotted out in the wild. A ransomware note named how to decrypt will be created in each scanned folder. So very kind of them, right? This note displays A, information about the attack, B, a link to the Tor negotiation site, and C, a link that copies an authorized key into the Windows clipboard needed by the victim 
to log in the Tor negotiation site. So here it says the entire network is encrypted. Encrypted. Your business is losing money. Uh, download the Tor browser, open the decryption page, authorize using this key, and in that way, you can com communicate to their support. And actually, in a way, you can negotiate with them, I'm sure, to a, a, a bit. You can negotiate with them about the ransom itself. But here's where you can uh, pay your, uh, your ransom. And, of course, ultimately, you do get your uh, keys back. And like I've talked about before, and even in class or other videos, many times you don't get the keys back. You pay your ransom, and sometimes your uh, files are out on, in, on the dark web for sale. So not only do you pay for your ransom, they're scattered about for sale on the dark web. So not a good thing. And um, Bleeping Computer, where I got these images from, has indicated that it is not clear how the Trigana breaches networks or deploys its ransomware. So that's really not known yet. And I suspect it's more from the typical social engineering that we've talked about where uh, you might receive a, a, a link in the email or mm, some sort of file that is recommended you download. And in the ethical hacking course, we talk about how to use tools in Kali Linux in particular to embed uh, 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 malware in files that a user could download. We also talk about doing that in an isolated environment because we don't want to get it out in the wild. We want to know how to do it as an ethical hacker and so we can know how to correct the action. So Trigana attacks have been increasing as I noted earlier and it seems like this may be a prevalent issue. It's kind of the same way that attacks are being done. I think they're ramping up, up on the sophistication. A nicer user interface, right? Uh, so it's kind of speaking to the sophistication of the ransomware market. Now, I've seen this one, this item too, Crafty Threat Hacker Uses Aged Domains to Evade Security Platforms. Now, this has been done over the past year or two in different aspects. And in fact, when doing a crime scene investigation, if you're an expert witness, uh, that we also talk about in uh, some of our courses, that my courses, if you do become an expert witness, a lot of times criminals will use older technologies. Remember the old zip drives? I, I had a, a case once where a, a bad guy was still using the old zip drive, and that was a kind of a cool technology, what, 20 years ago? But uh, who knows, they may be using five and a quarter inch floppies and all kinds of other things because a lot of times uh, law enforcement initially doesn't have that equipment. And uh, it, then they have to call in a consultant and acquire that. It just becomes a pain in the ass, a pain in the rear, sorry, uh, for, uh, to investigate that. And this is in a similar uh, vein, if you will. So a sophisticated threat actor named Cash Rewindo, and interestingly enough, I've actually seen some of this stuff on the web, has been using aged domains in a global malvertising. And I put that in quotes because I define what malvertising is. And of course, you can understand it's mal, bad advertising. Malvertising is the practice of incorporating malware into online advertisements. One of the most well-known methods of malvertising is clickjacking. So of course, when you click on an item, it hijacks your session and takes you elsewhere. So further, malvertising, especially in this case, involved the injection, and we've talked about injecting uh, JavaScript before, uh, but it injects JavaScript code in the digital ads uh, promoted by legitimate advertising networks, taking website visitors to pages that host phishing forms, drop malware, or operate some sort of scams. So the, each one of those, like, uh, um, it it's, looks legitimate. You click on it, and off it goes to uh, a, a seldom used website that looks legitimate but has uh, malware on it. The cash rewindo malvertising campaigns are spread across Europe, North America, South America, Asia, and Africa, the world, uh, using customized language and currency to appear legitimate to the local audience. So again, um, bad actors are getting more sophisticated so we don't have these roughshod uh, items anymore. They're pretty well cleaned up and they can lure you in because as I've noted in other uh, videos, when we get a little bit tired and we're more prone to social engineering attacks, we might look at something of interest. You know, sometimes at night I get my phone out because I wake up at 2 a.m. sometimes and I'll scan and there'll be some of these ads. And of course, I'm very conscientious, but if you're kind of sleepy, you might say, well, I want to click on 
making a million bucks in 20 days. So a cybersecurity analysis organization has been tracking Cash Rewindo since 2018, and I suspect it was probably started much earlier than that. And they noted that the threat actor stands out from uh, the usual by their crafty approach of cleaning things up and making them look uh, uh, quite legitimate. And off to the side, even though it's a little bit grainy, you can see uh, some of the ads there and in different languages as well. It's a little bit grainy. I took the screenshot and it, it looks a little blurry. Uh, so domain aging is when threat actors register domains and wait years to use them, hoping to bypass security platforms. Now I have probably a, a whopping, at one time I had tons of domains and they were just sitting, I went ahead and released them. I have maybe five, I think, um, two are active and three are just kind of sitting out there. Um, no, not from nefarious means, but uh, that's kind of along the same lines. I, you can sit there and, and your service provider, ISP, will say, oh, it's legitimate. This guy's owned it for 15 years or 10 years. So de domain aging works as an old as old domains that have not been involved in malicious activity for a long time earn the trust of the Internet, making them unlikely to be immediately flagged by security programs. So Cash Rewindo uses domains that have aged for at least two years and they already have certificates and they already seem quite legit. And a security firm also that was noted in this article was able to identify at least 487 domains used by a particular threat actor. So one threat actor is using 487 domains. Imagine how many threat actors out there are using this platform. And uh, some of the plat have been dated as far back as uh, 2008. Victims end up landing on these sites by clicking on infected ads found on legitimate, uh, legitimate sites. To evade strong language detection on legitimate sites, the threat actor flips between innocuous and call to action wording, usually starting the campaign uh, carefully and switching it to a call to action ads later. So a lot of the, even uh, some of the virus endpoint security will flag uh, um, the call to action. Even if you get it in an email, call to action, click on this as potential spam. Also, any websites, a lot of the endpoint security will do that. So this is how they evade uh, just getting generic language and then transitioning over to it because then the site sort of builds up trust, if you will. The malicious ads also feature, feature a tiny red circle that helps confuse computer vision detection modules so they cannot catch the fraud. A matter of fact, there's a little yellow circle right there on that coinage. It, it, it was uh, in the uh, image, it was red. There you go. Here's another red image right there, that little circuit circle. Each cash rewind campaign targets a particular audience, as we talked about. Um, it uh, uses landing page configure either to show uh, up or it is, again, it shows up as an innocuous page and it looks like it's invalid for targeting. But they craft it as they, they, they take these older websites and really kind of fiddle with them as they go along. Uh, this is done by checking the time zone, device platform, and language used on the visitor system in order to recraft that screen, if you will. And now look at this uh, ad. I know it's a little bit, it, you may have seen things like this. The banks are terrified. Secrets exposed. And click here. And a lot of times, you know, I've, I've been tempted and I have clicked on things like this. In my last video, I listed a few items that I've been social engineered on. So uh, even though I've been in the field quite long, uh, the attackers are getting more and more sophisticated. Again, we have to dial in on our own security. Users and devices outside the target audience uh, clicking the embedded click here button will be redirected, redirected to the innocuous site. And here's kind of a eye chart, if you will. And if you look at that, if it's JavaScript, the script type, it says JavaScript. It gives you the function functions and it looks uh, right there uh, for the image and thank you, et cetera. So the malicious JS snippet is running on, a, on valid targets, if you will. We do learn a bit about uh, JavaScript, a little bit in the ethical hacking course. However, JavaScript is one of those languages, if you're so compelled to learn, it's pretty straight up. It's pretty straightforward. It's like Python. It's a good language uh, to learn either one. Um, these, those users are taken to a scam page and the uh, fraudulent site is over to the right. 
It says crypto trader, cryptocurrency is earning 1700%. I can show you how to earn 1700% a month. You know, these kind of scams, so you fill in your information. Not only are you surrendering your private information, but you are led to a page that may have malware on it as well. Tricky, tricky. Um, a confidant uh, reports that in over 12 months, it has recorded 1.5 million cash rewind impressions, uh, primarily, primarily targeting Windows devices. And that's only one research area that's spotting this. Anyway, top uh, 20 most targeted locations. We've got a, a spread um, over in between Hungary, Poland, Croatia, uh, the Eastern European countries. And then you go down a little more towards the middle, you'll see the United Kingdom, a little further down, Italy, the US, Germany, and so on and so forth. So up on top, Hungary, look at that, 667,000. Poland, 573,000. And it's the way that uh, the attackers are opposed to um, uh, for these countries in particular. Again, um, the actor is using aged domains. So in conclusion, investment scams are widespread. You know, we've seen with cryptocurrencies, a lot of the YouTube stuff, quite frankly, is total BS when they said, oh, Shiba Inu is going to make you a, a billionaire with only a thousand sheep coins. Well, you know, you look at the potential market cap at some of that, those items. If SHIB was a, a dollar, it would exceed the market cap of all the cryptocurrencies out there. So a lot of them are just total BS. They try to get you to, they try to lead you on from YouTube or some other uh, news sites that have links to this kind of junk. And it kind of is an irritating thing, but we should know that it's really kind of the same way that we teach in certified ethical hacking about crafting uh, 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 the scripts behind the scenes, embedding them in websites or documents, and then launching them when the user gets social engineered into clicking on an ad or even uh, a link from a YouTube over, and I'm not just banging on YouTube, I really like YouTube, I use YouTube, uh, over to another uh, source, if you will. So just be cautious with that. Crash Rewind follows a different approach that requires more work, but significantly improves the chances of success for the threat actor. An investment opportunity that guarantees return is most likely a scam. So we all have to keep wary of that. I mean, there are some solid investment ideas out there, but please on investment ideas, we are also tempted sometimes, especially if we're struggling financially to get lured into these. So just pay due diligence to that and take care with those scams. Anyway, a third update, uh, the Defense Department releases zero trust strategy. Now I'm noting this in particular, I got a lot of students that watch uh, these videos, <laughs> I post them in my courses. So, and also for cybersecurity educators and researchers, uh, we all know this is coming down the pike. Zero trust, DOD has hundreds of thousands of suppliers and vendors and uh, besides the DIBnet, Defense Industrial Base, it even expands out to the commercial market. So zero trust will have a huge impact and that's why I'm bringing this up right now. So on November 22nd, just a few weeks ago, DOD released their zero trust strategy. Uh, I think they call it ZTA, Zero Trust Architecture. Zero Trust is a new approach. Well, really, it's been around a couple of years, but it's a new approach in the DOD parlance. Zero Trust em employs, here's what it is. It's, it's never trust, but always verify. Never trust uh, a connection. Never trust uh, a phone call. Never trust whatever type of interactivity you have going in your whole information system whether it's the IT based portion or even extended beyond that. So never trust anything, but always verify it. Then it, uh, it achieves that hurdle, if you will, of trust. It's uh, beyond the perimeter defense model. Before, when we've talked about this in other videos, the perimeter defense model is layered architecture. You might have uh, two or three different layers. That's what DOD recommended. And really um, uh, San the SANS Institute uh, initially proposed it in, I think, about 2003. So SANS Institute, a research organization, if you're new to cybersecurity, look up the SANS Institute. Good training courses, good solid research. So they pro proposed a layered, a tiered architecture model way back 20 years ago, where you would uh, subset your network into IP subnets. You would use uh, uh, both layer three and layer two technologies to isolate segments of your network. And that's still very valid, but now the new venue is 
zero trust, because if you think about it, uh, we don't always have our hands anymore on the network. Most organization, I would say in the neighborhood of 85% of organizations are using some sort of external uh, service, cloud provider. And so that kind of shatters the uh, network architecture, the layered architecture. So zero trust is a way of handling that. So DOD aims to fully implement zero trust by 2027. Um, sometimes, uh, I want to say this kindly, zero DOD is a little slow on the uh, trigger here. It may be 2030, honestly, but there is some intentional, I can see it already doing some consulting for, uh, the government. I can already see this in works. So zero trust, I already talked about the definition, assumes that there is no traditional network edge. We used to always say, this is our organization's network and here I got routers and switches and I can tear them up. The users are over here, uh, developments over there. We don't have that anymore. The network, the traditional network has been shattered. We're using so many different uh, cloud-based services, which are great, but you just have to secure. Uh, Zero Trust will impact how we learn about networks, how we manage networks, how organizational systems are constructed, how they are cyber secured, if you will. Um, let's see, following the strategies released, DODs will release, all DOD components are required to adopt and integrate zero trust capabilities, technologies, solutions, processes across their architecture systems and within their budget and execution plans. In other words, DOD is saying, hey, oh, if you're a, under the DOD's umbrella, if you're uh, under the umbrella, you are going to do this, put it in your budget. If you're associated with DOD, which means the defense industrial base, all those tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of organizations that build pieces and parts for the government or even supply, who knows, bananas and grapefruit to the government, eventually they're going to have to do uh, zero trust architecture. So uh, there's four goals. I'm not going to read this whole slide to you, but the four goals in, in a particular include zero trust cultural ad adoption. So that means training, uh, getting people on board to understand it in the company. Number two, defense department information systems are secured under uh, zero trust. And I said by 2027, uh, defend technology acceleration. So as you move forward, it's not just glomming things together. We have to look in the context of, oh, I'm expanding another department. How does that fit within my zero trust architecture and zero trust enable, enablement? Man, I tell you. Anyway, that, that kind of sums it up for the three items we talked about today. Um, please like, share this. And by the way, I do give this uh, information out, the references where I received it. Item three, there's really two supplemental articles about that if you want to do a little more research. And uh, please like this, share this. I'll, I'll keep, um, I'll, if you like it, you'll get notifications. Keep in contact with me. I provide you with all this information as well in uh, the YouTube area. So. Have a good day. Talk to you soon. Bye now.